<laughs> You'll find everybody's related somewhere. <laughs> all right. To all our guests, and there are many of you, welcome. We're glad that you would join us today on this very special occasion. So, let me begin with many people have asked the question, what will it be like when Jesus returns? And I don't think anyone can answer this question as well as Jesus. So here is his answer. When the Son of Man returns, <clears throat> it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. You might be wondering, taken where? They'll be taken away in judgment like those in the flood. So you two must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the Master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. <clears throat> the master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. <coughs> In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that is a description of the judgment awaiting everyone who has rejected Jesus as Lord. Those who know him are waiting for him, and many others are not, as in the time before the flood. Okay, Bill Lapp, would you open us up in a word of prayer, please? Good morning. Can we pray together? <laughs> Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We do look forward to your coming back. We pray your blessing on this service. We thank you for those who are visiting, and we pray that they'll have a blessing out of being here today. Now we ask your blessing on what is said, what is sung, and everything that happens today, may it bless you, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. And in his name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if you want to get out the hymnal there in the pew, it's red. And you want to open it to number 43. Number 43. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sing the, the numbers that have the arrows in front of them. Okay, so you see the arrows? That's what we'll be singing. So join me in standing, and we'll sing those three verses.
Okay, if you've got a prayer list and you turn it over, you'll see my announcements. Okay, my announcements that I have. Sue Caden happens to not be here, and she's got a birthday this week. So, when you see her next week, wish her a happy birthday. Who's she? <laughs> Somebody asking that? All right. Okay, and then we have the luncheon after the morning service, and that's downstairs. There's room for everybody, and we'll make a way, and we'll have a great time, so we encourage you to stay for the luncheon afterwards. Now, I want to tell you, it's not a buffet, meaning there's not millions and millions and millions of things, but there's plenty, okay? So we'll have a wonderful time afterwards. Okay, next announcement. Uh, pies for the jail. Uh, those of you that have been with us for multiple years, you know every year at this time of this season, we do pies. We take as many as anyone will provide and take them down to the jail for their Thanksgiving, and that benefits both the inmates and the staff. Okay? So, as in previous years, if you can help us, you can make a pie. I need it next Sunday. Okay, so you need to bring it in to me next Sunday. And so let me know before you leave if you're willing to make a pie or two and what you're going to do, and then I will notify them I'm bringing this many pies. Okay? Eastside Nursing Home facility sent me something in the mail this week. They're seeking gifts for the residents there in the home. And what they expressed is that some do have family members that come and visit them and things like that, but then there are many others that don't have that option. So Christmas time can be very lonely for them. So they sent a list, and some of you off the table back there picked it up. It's this list right here, okay? And there are all kind of items on there. Some are more expensive, some are least expensive. But I thought it would be a good idea for us to try and help. So the collection is going to go through Monday, December 16th. And what we'll do is the box that we had out in the hallway for you bringing the items for the shoe boxes, we'll have that back out in the hallway. And then every Sunday, if you can bring in what you want, put it in the box. The instructions are nothing has to be wrapped. They want everything to come in its original container. So if you buy anything, you don't even have to take it out of the container. Just bring as is and put it in the box. And then every Monday, I will be transporting the items down to East Side for them to go ahead and do however they've prepared to do for the residents. Okay, I hope that's a clear announcement. Everybody understands it, but... Whatever items you buy, you don't have to do anything with it. Just bring it in as is, put it in the box, and we'll transport it. The deadline for that, again, is going to be Monday, December 16th. Okay? All right. Next, <clears throat> I guess I'm going to call my wife up here. Come on up. She coordinated the shoe boxes that you see out in the hallway. Um, if you're visiting with us and wonder what were all those things in the hallway, it's a project that we do every year. Um, those boxes are sent all over the world to children in third world countries who don't have anything. And so they will get something for Christmas. And that's the purpose of it. And we're one of many churches in many different locations that do this at this time of year. The organization is Samaritan's Purse, who oversees the whole event. And we've been participating in this project for probably about 20 years. Been doing it every year for about 20 years. Okay, so give them a recap of yesterday. Maybe have anybody that helped yesterday stand up for recognition. Can you do that? Sure. Go ahead and I'll step out of the way. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Okay, well, um, let's start with that. All my little elves, can you stand up who helped me yesterday? There's Emily, Denise, the Carmichael clan, and Marilyn, Linda. Where's Linda? Way over there. Oh, there's Linda. And Diane, you're usually 
were together, so I got confused. <laughs> okay, and of course, Darren and myself, thank you. which isn't as much as last year, but we were in the 160s last year. But considering the financial aspect of where we are from last year, everything was so much more expensive to purchase. And it's just, um, it's just a blessing to know that we have folks who care enough about people who are in need of a little Christmas gift to um, spend their money and um, share with other people. And so uh, I want to thank you very much. You all made promises to get me things, and you came through on that, and um, put them all together, and it just makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> so thank you so much. Last year we did 161, which is the most we've ever done. Um, the year before that we did about 141. The year before that we did about 121. The year before that we did a little over 100. So every year we strive to increase. And so we were kind of hoping to get to 181, but we didn't get there. But the number that we got to, last year we did 161 we did reach 162. That's good, right? We did reach 162. So there was another little elf that brought in a few more boxes after the 158, so we went up to 162. And so that really pleases our heart because every box represents a family. That's 162 families that we can impact all over the world where these boxes are going. So the next step in our journey is to pray. Pray over those boxes that they will do the most good possible wherever they go. Okay, Bonnie, you've been waiting a long time to do this. Come on up. Come on up, all the way up here. Day one, 
when I was told that I had cancer. And he was with me through the whole thing. And I thank him so much. Now, I'll introduce the rest of my family. <laughs> the young gentleman behind Marilyn is Justice. And stand up as she announces you so we know. <laughs> and then, then the next one back, Aiden <laughs> and Peyton. Rachel, I'll be nice, Rachel. <laughs> Aaron, Tina. <laughs> Uh, who's next to Abby? Casey. And then Janelle. Oh, Jamie. Then Janelle. Ethan. Come on, Marianne. <laughs> now is it Gia? Then Rashawn. Then Bridget. And Mike. And the little one that Ethan's holding. As the newest member to Ethan or to Rashawn. And what's her name now? Aria. Aria. So I think I had her boy. Yep. <laughs> the entire time I've been here. I came in July of 2000 and I probably met Bonnie in the fall and how I met her was because of a gentleman in our congregation. He's still living but he lives north of Batavia but when I came his name is Skip Phillips. That's his nickname. It's Ralph. But here's the story is that when I came Ralph talked to me at length about Bonnie and Tina's mother, Mary. And so one day we were going to Warsaw, and this was after I had moved here, and I was following him. And he goes, I want to show you where she lives. Okay. He pulled over off the side of the road and pointed at the trailer. He said, right there, there's the lady. She lives right there. Go and see her. <laughs> so I started visiting probably about every other week something like that and I would go in and I would sit in the dining kitchen area with Marion and have a good wonderful time with her got used to Teddy any, any of you guys remember Teddy yeah Teddy the dog when I first started showing up he couldn't figure out if I was a friend or foe so he kind of kept his distance and growled and everything and then after a while then he became a good friend. And then I got to know Precious the cat? Baby. Baby the cat, okay. But it was just a wonderful blessing. And through that connection, I got to meet all the siblings. And I think there were seven daughters, am I right? Yeah. Seven. And Tina, you're, you're number seven, right? And Bonnie's up farther up the line. She's six. She's not far. Okay. <laughs> so I had a wonderful, wonderful, blessed time of getting to know the family, and it was through that contact I got to know about the rest of you in a roundabout way. And I remember, here's the other thing is, shortly after we were here, Marion, who's named after her grandmother, she's sitting back there in front of Diane, um, her two, I think it was, twins, came to one of our vacation Bible schools. You remember? I remember too. It was a long time ago. And I remember calling and paying a visit on Marion when you lived across the street from Maud Gerard near Prospect Street. That's how long ago that was. So yeah, so I had the chance to get to know some of these folks, and it's been a wonderful journey. 
And I'm so glad you have taken the time out of your busy schedule to come and be with us today and to share this wonderful occasion with mine. So again, thank you for being here. Okay, the next thing we want to do is we want to sing a hymn that's actually a chorus that's been specifically requested by Bonnie because it means so much to her. So it's hymn number 580, and it's actually just the chorus. A number 580. And so what we're going to do, because it's so short, we're going to sing through it twice. And then for those of you that are visiting with us, after we sing this, what we call our greeting hymn, we greet one another. And that means we just kind of interact and come out of our pews and stand around and talk and just welcome each other. All right? So... When we finish singing, that's what we do, just so you know. Join me in standing. We're going to sing through this twice, and then we'll greet each other.
14 kids. chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Here's what the apostle wrote in response. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, simply, we can see the dead in Christ are not left out, but they have a prominent place in the coming of Jesus. So after reading this reply, what would be the next question on the minds of these believers that received this letter? It has to be the idea of when. When. As human beings, we're slaves to wanting to know about future events before they happen. And we're easily wrapped up in predictions and become very interested in certain prognosticators concerning their ability to predict certain things accurately. If only we could know when something would happen before it happens, then we could be what? Save ourselves a lot of trouble, possibly, right? Besides prepared. But here is my thought. I don't think so. If we consider the warning involving the latest hurricane, and the loss of life in spite of everything they knew ahead of time. That's the sad news of the human condition. So, how does Paul answer this question of when? Well, look at chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what he writes. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Times and seasons usually help us to pinpoint a date of time. Now, why is there no need to spend our time focusing on a specific time or date for this coming of Christ for us? And I think Jesus gives us the best answer. Here's what he said. No one knows the date or the hour when the end will be. Not even the angels. No, nor even God's Son. Only the Father knows. So, be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Just as a man can't prevent trouble from thieves. But just as a man can prevent trouble from thieves by keeping watch for them, so you can't avoid trouble by all... So you can't avoid trouble, if I can get this straight... By always being ready for my unannounced return. So stay awake and be prepared for you do not know the date or the moment of my return. <laughs> so according to Jesus, we are not intended to know the specific time or the date in which he will come. It's a secret known only by God the Father. So we should be ready at all times... And not only on a specific day or a specific time. And if we did know, then how many would use that knowledge for selfish purposes instead of righteousness? I don't know the answer to that, but I think we can speculate. What can we know or can we know about the return of Jesus? Well, look at verse 2. He says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The coming of Christ ushers in two days which start simultaneously. Now, what are these two days known as? One is known as the day of Christ, and we just read about it in chapter 4. And it is Jesus gathering everyone who belongs to him to take them home with him. That's the day of Christ. Now, I might ask you, is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. If you know Jesus, it's a great day. I would liken it to Christmas for a child. We are going home with Jesus to receive whatever he has been preparing for us. The other day is known as the day of the Lord. And it involves everyone who doesn't belong to Jesus 
living on the earth at that time. Now, here's the comment made by Jesus to a group of believers about that event known as the day of the Lord. He said, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So those who dwell on the earth are those who only focus on the earth and nothing else. They have no other focus. God is not in their thoughts or on their minds at all. These folks are in for a trial that will put them into a situation best defined as, pardon the expression, as hell on earth. That's the explanation. Now, if we're looking for the day of Christ to come, then the contrast is they aren't looking for the day of the Lord to come. See, a thief comes when he is not expected. And this defines their preparation for this event. They aren't prepared at all and get caught without any means of survival. For example, listen to another comment made by Jesus to people living like this. He said to them, those who listen and don't obey are like a man who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it crumbles into a heap of ruins. And we might ask, well, why did this happen to them? And here's the Lord's answer. He says to a group of people like that, why do you call me Lord when you won't obey me? You see, people like this would never submit to the Lord by obeying him. They only wanted to do as they pleased in spite of the destruction that is coming towards them. Loss of life in hurricanes is preventable. Did you know that? Loss of life in hurricanes is preventable. If everyone would obey the instructions. <coughs> Some well-meaning people in the faith have tried to teach that we as believers will be present in this event known as the day of the Lord. And I want to completely dispel this idea in a very simple way that can comfort all of us. And you might say, how? Well, I'm going to do it by simply pointing out one or two words in verse 3. Okay? Just one or two. So look at verse 3. I'll read it. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Okay, so the first word I want to point out is the word they. And the second word I want to point out is the word them. Now, who is the apostle addressing in this letter? He is addressing the church in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I understand this right, they or them doesn't mean we or us. Am I right? This is about them who reject Christ, not us. This is as simple as I can understand it. Now, at the beginning of this event, according to verse 3, they, them, will do everything in their power to assure themselves of peace and security. And how do great leaders of the world attempt to do this? It's usually with a peace agreement that everyone thinks, oh, this is going to work. This is going to work. This is going to be great for all of us. We just signed this agreement. We just have this treaty. We're okay. We're safe. We're secure. And then as the apostle explains, all hell breaks loose on them like labor pains leading to a birth. Now, I have to ask, 
for those who have experienced labor pains. Did these things, these labor pains, make it feel like your world was coming to an end? Huh? I had a kidney stone, and I felt that way. Okay? The pain was severe, and it just wouldn't stop. Is that like labor pains? Don't be afraid. I won't ask you to come up here. Okay? For these earth dwellers, there is no escape like the labor pains of a pregnant mother-to-be. Now, do these people stuck on the earth, do they want to escape this trouble? Well, here is the Apostle John's answer. Listen to this. He gives a great description. He says, the kings of the earth and world leaders and rich men and high-ranking military officers and all men, great and small, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and rocks of mountains and cried to the mountains to crush them. Fall on us, they pleaded. Hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne and from the great anger of the Lamb, because the great day of their anger has come, and who can survive it? That's an example. Then listen to this other comment recorded again by the Apostle John. He writes, in those days, men will try to kill themselves, but won't be able to. Death will not come. They will long to die, but death will run away. So they can't hide, nor can they successfully end their lives to escape this dreadful event on the earth. And this event is prepared for them, as the apostle is writing, not us who belong to Christ. Now, if you're unsure still, then allow me to point out the next detail. Verse 4. Here's what it says. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So first of all, these people being addressed in this letter are called brothers to the apostle. He doesn't call them Jews, and he doesn't call them Gentiles. He calls them brothers. And that tells me what? They're in God's kingdom like he is, not standing outside of it. And the next detail is that these brothers of the apostle aren't in the darkness as those others are. So what does this mean? Here's the answer that Jesus gave. There is no eternal doom awaiting those who trust the Messiah to save them. But those who don't trust him have already been tried and condemned for not believing in the only Son of God. Their sentence is based on this fact. That light from heaven came into the world, but they loved the darkness more than the light, for their deeds were evil. They hated the heavenly light because they wanted to sin in the darkness. They stayed away from that light for fear their sins would be exposed and they would be punished. But those doing right come gladly to the light to let everyone see that they are doing what God wants them to. So we who know Jesus choose not to live in the dark like others. And we gladly step into the light because we aren't hiding anything. We want to be accountable for how we live unlike others who don't. Now listen to this next statement of our Lord. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So I understand that to mean 
We, meaning those in Christ, will not be in the dark or live in the dark because the light of Jesus Christ is within all of us who know him. Now let me enlist John in giving a supporting statement. He says, this is the message God has given us to pass on to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if we say we are his friends, but go on living in spiritual darkness and sin, we are lying. But if we are living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ does, then we have wonderful fellowship and joy with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. This day of the Lord is designed to deal with those living in the dark, not in the light. So what happens to us? Well, we are in that event described in chapter 4, known as the day of Christ. And look at verse 5. He says, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. And we might say, well, what day could he be talking about when he's talking to us? It's the day of Christ. Now, will Jesus be able to find all of us so we aren't here for the day of the Lord? Will he be able to find all of us? And the answer is right. Of course. Now, maybe some might think of stowaways secretly escaping the day of the Lord to be present at the day of Christ. I mean, if I'm thinking about it, I think I want to be a stowaway, right? I want to get out of that day of the Lord and I want to sneak over to the day of Christ so that I escape. Stowaway, okay? Listen to a song in answer to this hypothetical situation. Are there any stowaways in the day of Christ? Here's the answer. The righteous are like trees along a riverbank bearing luscious fruit each season without fail. Their leaves shall never wither and all they do shall prosper. But for sinners, what a different story. They blow away like chaff before the wind. Now, for me today, I would say like dandelions in the yard. How many of you have ever seen dandelions? <laughs> when they've got the fuzzy white things on them. And when the wind blows, what happens to the fuzzy white things? They're carried away by the wind. That's what the psalmist is saying. And he goes, they are like that fuzzy white stuff. Those that don't know Christ, carried away by the wind. And the point is this, they are not safe on judgment day. They shall not stand among the godly. For the Lord watches over all the plans and paths of godly men. But the paths of the godless lead to doom. Now, here's another thought. Should the day of the Lord panic us in Christ or cause us to live in dread as if we will go into it? Huh? No. Look again at verse 5. He says, We are not of the night, nor of darkness. You know where we are? We're in Christ. So we don't go into the day of the Lord. We go into the day of Christ. And we're safe. Now, let me tell you, at this stage of time, right now, talking about right now, where we are, neither day has commenced. Okay? The day of the Lord and the day of Christ has not started. So the question is, what should we do in this interim of time leading up to both days? What should we do? Look at verse 6. He says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Now, what does this mean? Let us not sleep as others do. Well, let me illustrate it this way. 
Maybe you've heard this phrase in our culture. Don't be asleep at the <coughs> switch. Right? Don't be asleep at the switch. For example, let me say it this way. If you're driving a car, should you do it with your eyes closed? <laughs> okay? Why not? <coughs> you could cause an accident. So we would say, this is a critical activity for not sleeping. Right? Am I right? Driving a car. Okay, how about this one? If I'm walking near the top edge of a tall building, should I do it with my eyes closed? No. Well, why not? You might walk off the edge and you'd fall to your death. Again, this is a critical activity for not sleeping, right? Folks, this is a critical time to be living in and to avoid just mindlessly drifting through it. <coughs> the opposite of approaching it mindlessly is what? Well, here's the answer in Scripture, verse 6. But let us watch and be sober. Let's start with watch, okay? When I watch, my eyes have to be what? Open. Exactly right. My mind has to be on alert. That's the point in this critical time. Is there anything else? Well, yes. Look again at verse 6. He says, and be sober. Now, what is the opposite of this being sober in our modern, modern culture? We say, well, if he's not sober, he has to be drunk. And how does one get drunk? They act in a reckless manner, intending to do that. Okay? Should we be acting reckless or out of control in anything we do in this critical time? And the answer is no. We don't want to injure anyone. We don't want to injure ourselves. We should want to be living, as Paul explains, to those living in the capital of the Roman Empire. He said another reason for right living is this. You know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up. For the coming of the Lord is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day of his return will soon be here. So quit the evil deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of right living as we who live in the daylight should. Be decent and true in everything you do so that all can approve your behavior. Don't spend your time in wild parties and getting drunk or in adultery and lust or fighting or jealousy. But ask the Lord Jesus Christ to help you live as you should. And don't make plans to enjoy evil. And I would say, that's very good sound advice for us that are in Christ. What is the contrast to us in Christ concerning those who live in the dark? Look at verse 7. He writes, For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. So let me illustrate this as the current of the world. And I'd like you to picture the current of the world like a mighty river, say the Mississippi, or one of those famous rivers, which has a mighty current, okay? But this current of the world, the mighty river, is flowing toward definite destruction. And I would say like Niagara Falls, definite destruction. Now, some people are in that current, mindless to its flow. They are accustomed to its direction, and they simply allow it to lead them downward. As long as they have what they want, they couldn't care about the direction of the current they are in. 
Then there are others who are actively pursuing destruction by, for example, being in a canoe and paddling as fast as you can in the direction of Niagara Falls. And there are people like that. And sometimes these two switch places for a time, and then they switch back. But again, they're both going the same direction toward destruction without any desire to ever change. And that is true. That's living in the dark. Should we who know Christ act like this? What do you say? No. Then how should we that know Christ act? Look at verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober. There's that word again. Be sober. And we know sober means to not be reckless. Like both examples involving mind-numbing assent to go with the flow or to actively participate in the current of evil. So what does acting sober look like for us? Well, again, here in verse 8, he says, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Okay? A breastplate was designed to cover your most vulnerable organs in your body. So this would be your heart, and this would be your lungs to begin with. And in this example, we are talking about our spiritual lives being vulnerable. Our only protection is first to live by faith. And we might say, well, faith in what? Is it my finances? Is it my health? Is it my job? Is it my family? What is it? It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only sober step in this life is to live by faith in Jesus Christ every day and every night. And Jesus said, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Our only protection in this life is not only to live by faith, but also to practice love. And what are the two most important commands in the entire Bible? Okay, here it is. One, it is the love of the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second one is to love your neighbors like you love yourself. So if we love God, then this fuels our love for others, and we will not choose to recklessly hurt anyone, including God. Instead, we will do what is best concerning God and concerning others. And this will eliminate living selfishly in this life. That's a good step of being sober. Being sober also includes one more detail. In verse 8, he says, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, tell me, we wear helmets on our feet, right? No. We put a helmet on our heads. In fact, Carson here played on the football team this fall. You wear a helmet to protect your head and your brain. From concussion. That's the hope. Well, for us, it's all about protecting our mind. You see, our minds need protection in this current age. If we get caught up in the current of the world, our minds will drift into hopelessness. This means we will allow fear and worry to control us in everything involving finances, health, where we live, our families, our jobs, or whatever else is happening in the world. But instead of being reckless in our thinking, what should we be focused on? It's the day of Christ. When Jesus comes to take us home, to 
be with him. This is our enduring hope that we will be rescued from what is coming to this earth. Our future is better than anything this earth has to offer. So why allow it to cause our minds to drift into hopelessness as Christians? There is really no reason for it. But how can we be sure this is what the apostle means? Well, here's what he writes in verse 9. He says, For God did not appoint us to wrath. What? As Christians, God did not appoint us to wrath. And I have to ask, why not? Here's why. God the Father in heaven poured out every bit of my judgment for all my sins on Jesus Christ, which caused him to die. Every bit of wrath I deserve from God God in heaven was poured out on Jesus. Every single bit of it. The day of the Lord is his judgment being poured out on all who are not covered by the death of Jesus. He's already poured all his wrath out. That was intended for me on Jesus. I'm safe. That's the truth. Does God the Father intend for us in Christ to experience his wrath even though Jesus died bearing our wrath from above? The answer is no! Never! Boy, that is freedom. That's release from every care and every worry I could ever have. And he goes on to say right here, he says, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. His intention for us in Christ, it's to obtain salvation or rescue from his wrath. When Jesus comes to take us home, we will not suffer like others who are left on the earth. And this final comment seems to harmonize with what he said in chapter 4 when he said this, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. And I'm like, I'm glad for that. How should the truth about the day of the Lord impact me as a Christian? Well, this is what he says. He says, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. And you know that sounds surprisingly like the last part of chapter 4 when he said in verse 18 therefore comfort one another with these words. It's the same message for Christians. We should comfort we should encourage we should strengthen each other in the truth. Right? Our hope is to Now let me focus on something that illustrates a companion truth. And this is what I'm going to do in closing. These hurricanes which ravaged our country are terrible events. Would you agree? Yes. I mean, they're horrible events. Let me ask you this question. How many people did you want to see dead as a result of these things? None. I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing. None. And the reason is why no one wants anyone to die. Now, let me ask you, pertaining to those events again, how many did you want to see lose everything from those horrible hurricanes? I'm in agreement. Why? No one wants to see anyone suffer like this. Now, I have something to tell you that's not good. Did you know there's another terrible hurricane coming? And it's already been named. This is the name of it. Are you ready? It's called the wrath of God. It's the wrath of God. And it's coming. What do you want to
to do for those in harm's way? What do you want to do for them? Pray for them. Help them. And maybe we should also take stock of ourselves and say, are we in harm's way? Yes. Now I want to say something, okay? Bonnie has done what she could today in inviting all of you to hear her testimony and the truth about the coming wrath of God. <laughs> And why did she do this? Why did she put herself out on a limb to do this? She doesn't want any of you to lose your life when God's wrath is unleashed on this earth. That's the truth. What can anyone do that is standing in harm's way of a hurricane known as God's wrath? It's very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Amen. That's the answer. Believe on Jesus Christ, and he will save you. And then you'll be able to join the rest of us and say, I am saved too. I will not face that, because Jesus took all my wrath away. There is no wrath intended for me now. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we thank you for the opportunity and the time that we've had to spend together. It's been a privilege and an honor to be in your word, to gain this information that is so necessary for us as those that believe, and even for those who don't. It really clears things up about what the future holds and how the coming of your son is going to initiate two days, two clear days, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. And my hope and prayer today is that many in this room will be part of the day of Christ and avoid the day of the Lord. I would ask, Father, that in the time remaining that you would continue to work in the hearts and minds of anyone here that's unsure unsure of the future concerning where they'll be. I would ask that you would give them help and make it very clear and guide them, anyone that's unsure, to the path of your son. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish. Thank you for being here with us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close our service with just a hymn. Uh, it's number 305. Number 305, and I'll ask you to stand when you find your place. And we're just going to sing the first and the third verse. All right, just the first and the third. That's all we're going to sing. Number 305.
And so the last thing we need to do is, Donald, if you pray over the food that's going to be served downstairs and pray a blessing on our time together, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, coming to give you thanks for the beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the message that we have heard, heard today, Lord. Bless our pastor for preaching it to us so we have a full understanding and we thank you for that. We also ask, Lord, that if there be anybody in around the world, in our community, that don't know you personally, let this be a time in their life that they reach out, call upon your name, and receive you in their life as a Lord and Savior. And we thank you for their salvation. We also ask you, Lord, to bless Israel and the Israelites. Lift them up spiritually. And if there be any over there, Lord, that don't know you, let them call upon your name and receive you into their life as a Lord and Savior. We thank you. We thank you for watching over President-elect Donald Trump. We ask that this be a day that they will call upon your name, confess their sin, and receive you into their life as their Lord and Savior. As so they come into the light and not walk in the darkness, and we thank you for that. We ask you, Lord, to bless the food that we're about to have. Come and enjoy it with us, and we thank you for it. We ask you to multiply it to be enough for all. In your name, Jesus, we thank you. Amen.